Welcome everyone to the next in the series of Masterclass in Foot and Ankle Surgery Lectures. Uh, my name is Rhys Thomas. I'm a consultant foot and ankle and sports surgeon in Cardiff in the UK. Um, I'm a member of the BOFAS Education Committee and have organised principals courses both in the UK and in India. Uh, my main interest is sporting injuries of the foot and ankle, and I am honorary surgeon to a number of uh, professional and semi-professional sports teams. So today's talk is on stress fractures of the foot and ankle. We'll discuss uh, which stress fractures you find in the foot and ankle. We'll be highlighting uh, those particular stress fractures which are at significant risk of giving you problems, particularly of non-union. And we'll also be discussing some tips and tricks uh, to get you out of trouble, particularly if you're dealing with these uh, injuries surgically. Uh, and this will be highlighted by a number of different cases. So what is a stress fracture? Well, it's caused by microscopic injuries where the bone is subjected to repeated submaximal stresses. This can lead to stress responses or to macrophalia and frank fracture. As we know, the military or athletes are at particular risk of these fractures. So stress fractures can occur in three main ways. So in the athletic population or in overuse injuries you have abnormal stresses being placed on normal bones. In insufficiency fractures or pathological fractures there are normal stresses which occur on abnormal bone and you can also get a combination of the two. So what are the risk factors? Well we've talked about repeated submaximal stresses so any athletic activity or military activity such as running, jumping or marching, they can occur in those people with lower bone density and, and females are at particular risk. When considering sporting injuries, you've got to look for any change from normal activity. So a change in training regime, whether certain mileages or, or uh, terrains have been included in training through to uh, a change in uh, training shoes or footwear which have been used during that sporting activity. And if people are going into a sporting activity with little in the way of pre-participation conditioning, if they're going into something fairly unfit, then their risk factor for having risk factor for having a stress fracture is increased. We must remember the female risk triad, uh, which can occur in female athletes, repeated stress, low bone marrow density, and dietary restraint, uh, usually on a background of amenorrhea. So Metatarsal fract stress fractures cause 38% of all lower limb stress fractures. The second and third are the most commonest, but the fourth and particularly the fifth metatarsal base are those that potentially give us the most problem. The second or third metatarsal stress fractures, otherwise known as March fractures, present with possibly non-specific foot pain, they may present with swelling, both with periosteal reaction and abundant callus formation, and this may cause a palpable mass. They are uh, particularly found in uh, military recruits, hence the term march fracture, but also in dancers, particularly uh, when they go up on toes, as can be seen in this picture. X-rays initially may be negative, Certainly within two weeks, they may well be negative. However, after that time, they, might, they may start to show uh, abundant callus. Second and third metatarsal stress fractures often occur around the neck region. 
If an X-ray is negative and you are still suspicious of a stress fracture, then an ultrasound scan may show an early periosteal reaction and may be helpful. But an MRI scan will show a stress reaction and or a fracture, particularly uh, when seen at the base of the second or third metatarsals, which can be difficult to diagnose on X-ray even when they are present. These fractures almost always are treated with rest and protected weight bearing and avoidance of activity. They almost always go on to heal. Occasionally, stress fractures at the base of the second metatarsal can become problematic and can go on to non-union. If they are persistent uh, and causing symptoms, then they can be treated with a bridge plating technique as may be uh, used in a Liz Frank injury. Uh, this will usually give them enough stability to allow them to mature and to go on to heal. Fourth and fifth metatarsal fractures, however, are a slightly different thing. They're at a greatly uh, increased uh, risk of a delayed or non-union. They may also refracture, and if they are treated with conservative non-weight bearing, they often require an extensive non-weight bearing period to go on to healing. So why are they at greater risk of non-union? Well, there may be lateral overload of the fore and midfoot, particularly if there's a cava varus foot or there is evidence of metatarsus adductus, where the metatarsals, instead of being parallel to the midline, actually cross over the midline into adduction. Uh, there's potentially greater mobility around the lateral side of the foot when, with the fourth and fifth metatarsals, particularly when compared to the second and third. And also, particularly in the fifth metatarsal, there is a watershed blood supply area to the proximal aspect of the metatarsal. If we consider the anatomy of the base of the fifth metatarsal, there are areas where we get avulsion fractures, usually caused by an avulsion of the plantar fascia or the peroneus brevis. There are then uh, proximal fifth metatarsal fractures, which occur in the fourth to fifth uh, articulation region, and then diaphyseal shaft metatarsal fractures. Here we can see one of the potential reasons why the base of the fifth metatarsal may be slow to heal in this relatively avascular zone where there is a watershed between the metatarsal metaphyseal arteries and the proximal 